so Max, I've I've another question for you. What year will the glorious communist revolution succeed? <laughs> well, um, let's see. Let me let me check my watch. No, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to the 91st episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 13th of December and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. The podcast is officially seven years old this week and I just can't wait for the hormones to hit and the hairs to start growing. Today we're speaking with Maximilian Alvarez, the host of the excellent Working People podcast by, for and about the working class. This week, I have the new Patreon subscriber, Cage433, to thank. Thanks to everybody who's helped out through the years and kept the good ship Alpha afloat. If you'd like to fire some funds my way, or would like to participate in or vote on the book choice for the upcoming reading group series, you can do so by signing up as a Patreon for as little as $1 an episode. Right then, to the discussion. Yeah, I mean, like the podcast is um, is going really well. Um, you know, it's I think it's it's turned into kind of more than I kind of ever really could have hoped or or expected when I got it started. Although, you know, to be fair, I don't think I really knew what to expect when when I got it started. It was more kind of like an impulse and a yearning, very much kind of feeling around in the dark. In my everyday life, I'm a I'm a like a hardcore theory head. I mean, I'm a I'm a dual PhD candidate, you know, who just like sits around with my freaking books, um, kind of writing about uh, Marxist theory a lot of the time. And you know, as a as a writer, you know, columnist for the Baffler and contributor to other places, um, and organizer, you know, like I'm I'm very much kind of involved in these leftist circles where, yeah, you know, after a while, you you really start to kind of feel the if if things aren't kind of done, um, you know, carefully, you can really start to feel the absence of of the working class of real people of you know like and and I think for me that was kind of already tied to the feelings that I was having being in academia and, you know, kind of being a first generation student along with my siblings and, and kind of always feeling that disconnect, you know, between the stuff that I was doing every day and, you know, the person I was when I would go back home <clears throat> or when I would talk to my folks or my friends, friends back in California where I grew up, you know, there is a lot of kind of, you know, theoretical meat in this kind of interaction, right? In these kinds of interviews, in this kind of project, you know, to to kind of foster more open kind of human dialogue with the very folks that, you know, uh, according to us on the left, we are trying to mobilize and are trying to kind of quote unquote, raise consciousness, you know, for, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's been very much uh, uh, an experience doing this podcast, even though, you know, we, we've, we haven't been around for too long, but I think um, what we've done has been really exciting and there's a lot more in the works, but even just that little bit, you know, has kind of rewired a lot of the ways that I think about politics and theory and stuff like that. So I think, so I guess I'm just trying to kind of uh, get ahead of it and, and tell your listeners not to tune out just yet. So, Max, tell us about your new podcast and why you decided to do it. Thank you for, you know, kind of asking me to uh, to talk about this. It's really, really exciting to be on the show. And then I'm really happy to find in your show a, a, an enormous archive of stuff I can nerd out about now, uh, too, while I'm washing dishes and stuff. But the the podcast is called working people. The tagline is a podcast by, for, and about the working class today. Conceptually, it's very simple. I mean, it is it is a show based on doing long form interviews with working class folks from around the United States. You know, like some of the interviews go over two hours. You know, ideally, we'd like them to be about, you know, an hour and a half, and I'll give like a you know 10 to 15 minute intro. But honestly, I just kind of let the discussions go where they will. 
it's really, I think, a place for people to actually just sit down, unplug for a while and, and just listen to the life story of, you know, the people who make this country run. Right? You know, the people who, you know, work every day of their lives and whose stories are rarely the ones that, you know, we, we hear about or that we ever take the time to really kind of sit down and listen to. And I mean, I think as, as I've found just conducting these interviews, and I think as, as other people have found just listening to them, you know, these stories are incredible, right? Everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a complex and rich history of dreams, accomplishments and struggles and heartbreak and everything is, you know, packed with meaning and significance. And, and, you know, we walk past these kinds of stories every day, right? You know, you're walking down the street in London and centuries of experience are flooding past you in the kind of accumulated years of lives lived in the people passing by on the street. You know, I think that <clears throat> there's, there's real human and political value in kind of recognizing that complexity in ourselves and, and in each other. No kind of political program, no understanding of history can ever really, you know, be sufficient if we don't take seriously, you know, that sort of complexity that every person kind of carries around with them. But to the kind of thrust of the show, we live in a, you know, monstrous capitalist economy that, you know, does the work of silencing these stories and convincing us those of us who have them that they're not worth sharing that they're not interesting right you know that 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 they're not even the primary source of meaning in our lives right that our productive um capacities are you know the most worthwhile thing about us and that's obviously a big part of the show we talk about you know workers and what they do but you know, I, I, I really try not to make that, you know, the defining thing. In fact, the entire show is based on showing how people in these jobs are so much more than we, you know, think about every day as, you know, like our relationships to each other, whether we're like just exchanging pleasantries with like a cashier or an Uber driver, you know, like those kinds of relations don't allow for us to see the complexity in each other. Right. To see the, the humanity in each other. Right. And that is part of the fabric of how capitalism alienates us from each other. Right. And convinces us that we and our own internal worlds are the only real thing, are the only objects of concern. And that the rest of our lives should be spent kind of feeding that little thing inside of us that tells us that we're the most important beings in the universe. And, and, and that tells us that other people are kind of uh, the background to our, to our own story without, you know, like allowing us to see ourselves as, as being a part of a world in common. A friend of mine is a scriptwriter, and he was saying when he was in college, learning about film writing that he was asking a lecturer or something that why does everybody have to be like a famous person why does everybody you know have to be a king or a queen in in a drama or a businessman a billionaire and the professor said something along the lines of well you know for them the arc the fall from from grace or whatever will be bigger so it has a more of an impact it always just struck him and me that that was like quite belittling that to just regular people can have arcs just as important as famous intellectuals, businessmen, sportsmen, you name it. Absolutely. If you listen to, you know, the episodes that, that I've recorded so far and like the first thing that jumped out to my mind when, when you were talking just now, I mean, like if you listen to... Uh, you know, one of the more recent episodes that I did with, um, you know, Vicky Shannon Allen, who is a, an Amazon warehouse worker in Texas. I mean, like, we don't even really get to talking about Amazon until about an hour and a half into the interview. But if you listen to like the first part of that, 
if you listen to her just talk about growing up under just like these brutal conditions with a stepmother who was just, you know, evil and, and, and vicious to her and her siblings. And if you listen to her talk about falling in love with her ex-husband and then the kind of story of their divorce, I mean, you're, you're seldom going to find, you know, like a more human and kind of striking story you know, of, of, of love and life and loss and, and perseverance, you know, in any book, you know, not everyone is good at, you know, like, I guess, like kind of narrating in, in ways that are kind of familiar to us and ways that we've kind of been trained to see as, as having the sort of narrative arcs and character development and plots that, you know, we recognize as kind of like what story should be. But everyone has a a story worth telling. You could be someone like Vicky, who just is being so honest, saying on the interview stuff that she admits. She's like, I haven't talked to anyone about this in years. And she just, you know, opens up in a way that is just mesmerizing and heartbreaking and just, again, makes you realize at your core that like, you know, like, no, this this isn't someone who can just be exploited and forgotten about you know, for the sake of making profits, like no, no human being should be treated like this. Not Vicky, not anybody. Right. But we don't see that kind of complexity. Or if you, you know, listen to the episode I did with LaDonna Braybull Allard from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe in North Dakota. I mean, like she's probably one of the best storytellers I've ever encountered in my life. You know, there were times in that interview where I forgot I was supposed to be asking questions because I was just so enraptured by what she was saying and how well she was saying it and and just the kind of pauses and details and passion that she was putting into these stories. And and I guess that's that's kind of been the biggest surprise to me, even doing the show, you know, like I, I started it knowing that this was kind of in the abstract. I knew this was the case. Right. I knew that people were way more complex than we give them credit for. Right. Then we're they're way more complex than we're kind of trained to see in our you know economic and social reality today. I still don't think at a practical level I was prepared for how open and honest and gripping people from so many different parts of the country could be if they were just given that opportunity to, you know, tell the story of their lives the ways that they wanted to. And I think it just kind of drove home for me how desperately we need to give ourselves that space to do so, right? And give others the space to do so, right? And build, you know, a vision for, for what is necessary and good, you know, out of that, out of, out of talking with each other and, and, and kind of seeing laid bare the completely honest and vulnerable and, and, and quirky and, and funny and weird humanity of, of the people that we share this world with. Yeah, I don't know. Have you seen the film Manchester by the Sea? Uh, I haven't, and it may just be because a uh, comrade told me to boycott it. I don't know, it just jumps out of my head. Didn't the main actor have some, some oh, trouble? Sex candle. Yeah, oh, that's something right. like that. Indeed, yeah. Who is it? It's your man, um, Casey Affleck. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's why I didn't see it. No, it's just, it's quite a work. If, unusually for like an American film, it's, you know, it's quite working class. There's a scene in it where he's after he had been drinking with his buddies in his house late and they had a fire on and he went to the pub to go and get more beer at a shop. And when he came back, his house was burning down and all of his kids had basically been killed in the in the fire. And they had this scene of him back in the police station. It was this kind of moving scene where he was like, you know, devastated. He was sitting there and he, I think he tried to commit suicide, he tried to grab a, a gun from one of the policemen to kill himself. And all the time in this, they, there was no kind of sound. I think I have this correct anyway. They've no, they had no like dialogue or stuff in sound. And they just had one of these like Baroque, Bach, musical pieces you know these like kind of great great classical music piece going over for about three to four minutes and i remember watching it thinking like god that's really weird very jarring and i was just thinking like if this was this was in some film where it was about some 
businessman and his life falling apart and some 1929 Wall Street crash happening or something, it would be very normal. Like, it would not feel unusual. But because it was just some punter, some regular carpenter or something, this happened to him. There was this great juxtaposition between this, like, high art music and the tragedy of just a normal guy. And it, it was really jarring. Like, I, 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 it stuck at me ever since. It always reminds... Your podcast reminds me of that scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Shit, that sounds, yeah, like incredible and heavy. And I, I guess I should take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but but no, I, I, I definitely see, you know, kind of what, what you're getting at. And, and, and honestly, that's how it feels for me. And in many ways, that's kind of how the podcast, uh, the idea for the podcast came to be. Right. Is that, you know, you know, going back to your first question, I think I said that, that my dad <clears throat> was a, you know, major influence on me in terms of getting this podcast going. And in fact, the very first episode that I did was an interview with him. You know, it was something that, that I think I needed to do for myself and that I wanted to do for our family. But again, having kind of no notion of where it would go and having no expectation that it would end up being as raw and open and honest as it ended up being. Because for so long, my dad had been sitting in that kind of silence, right? I mean, obviously, he didn't, our house didn't burn down. He didn't lose his kids, but we did lose our house. You know, we lost everything in the recession. My family didn't really know how to process it. Right. And so I think we started to kind of lose each other bit by bit. Right. We started to recede into our own kind of interior worlds and feeling more isolated from each other. And that just kind of compounded the intensity of every silence, you know, and every absence of regular conversation, you know, that, that the kind of conversations that we would have before the recession right? The kinds of details and, and jokes and, and, and all the things that were part of our just familial social interactions, those were splintered now in a way that, you know, I think was just wreaking havoc on, on each of us internally and, and all of us collectively. My dad was never, you know, a big, you know, talker, um, it's not to say he was just like completely Spartan and, and taciturn, but I mean, he's a, he's a man, of few words. And, you know, if you hit some of the topics that he's really into, like, uh, you know, aliens or sports, um, you know, you can get a, you can get a really good conversation going, but I mean, um, you know, it's, he's definitely someone that you kind of, you know, have to have to do the work to, to kind of tease out what, what he's thinking about. But that's not to say, you know, that, you know, when he's silent, there isn't a galaxy of complex thoughts and memories and feelings kind of in motion. Right. But but we don't see that. Right. And, I, and a lot of times I think we don't even see that when we're doing it ourselves. And that was kind of where I was when I decided to make the podcast. You know, I was I kind of become my dad in that way after kind of everything that happened at home. And, you know, kind of being involved in that, like before I came to Michigan to, to, you know, get back into academia and to do my PhD. I mean, after I moved back from England, um, I, I, you know, moved back home. I knew things were bad. You know, I thought like everyone else in my family, that it was just kind of a hump we needed to get over. If we stuck together, we'd be okay. And that, you know, maybe I could like help out um, for a bit while I was thinking about what my next move would be. And then, you know, months and months later and hundreds of job applications later, you know, I'm sitting there with two degrees and not knowing how I'm going to pay for food. And, I'm, you know, I have to go to these temp agencies at like three in the morning where it's just me and other kind of, you know, tired, middle aged mainly Latino men, you know, we would sit there at these temp agencies for hours waiting for our names to be called because they would just kind of get calls in the morning for, they'd say, we need five people at this factory, right? Or, you know, we need three people at this job doing those jobs. Like, I mean, we, everyone in our family has worked shitty jobs. Like that was never, you know, like a problem, but I think it felt kind of more 
real and, and inescapable in a way that I don't think it ever had been before the recession working with, with these guys, talking with these guys, everyone kind of feeling despondent and closed off and clearly having so much welled up inside them, but feeling not only like they couldn't really communicate it, but that no one would want to listen anyway. Right? These were the guys that I was working alongside at, you know, the warehouse where we were pulling like 12, 13, 14 hour days and at the end of it, like dripping in sweat, our backs like, you know, aching and knees aching. The managers would just walk down a row of us and point to the ones they wanted to come back the next day. And everybody else, after they had been completely wrung out of everything that they had to offer, you know, half of them would be told, you know, thanks. We don't want you back tomorrow, you know, or or when I was working at this factory where we were in full hazmat gear And our job was to kind of like dig into these piles of soiled laundry from the hospitals in the area. And these things were just covered in like blood and shit and piss. And there were syringes in there. And I mean, guys were running off the line and throwing up and never coming back. I mean, like you just kind of you kind of turn off, right? You kind of become numb and you again, you recede into yourself in a way that, you know, bosses want us to. Right? They don't want us talking to each other. They don't want us kind of seeing each other as kind of going through these things and 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 feeling these things at as deep of a level as we are, right? Because if we just kind of shut down and ha- leave enough electricity on to kind of do our work and go home and come back the next day, right? You know, that's that's really all they want from us. Even when I went to grad school, I was still feeling this. And, and, and you know, grad students, you know, here we make you know, below the poverty line. So it's not like my, my economic woes were somehow solved. And that's when I was here at grad school, that's when, you know, like my family lost the house. And that's when, you know, every month it seemed there was another bill that we couldn't pay and that there was, there was some other crisis that we had to tend to. You know, I think that for me and for my dad, but for all of us, you know, in, in our own ways, you know, we, we just kind of shut off, tried not to acknowledge this kind of hard reality and tried to kind of maintain some sense of normalcy without, you know, really kind of being there. We were more like, like shadows of ourselves. You know, I, I I think all of us just kept telling ourselves that if we kept putting our heads down and worked our way through that, eventually we would kind of break the surface and things would go back to normal and everything would be like it was. Right. And we wouldn't be terrified to like look at our bank accounts. You know, we we wouldn't be terrified to check the mailbox, you know, or or to see a, a notice taped on the door or stuff like that. And I think I just kind of realized that I had been living in this sort of suspension that I thought was just temporary, you know, that I thought, you know, would pass soon enough. You know, I'd been living this way for like five, six years. Did you come to the left at that time or was it before everything went bad for the family? I would say that was definitely the the kind of radicalizing point. I mean, like there was the raw material and then I got to grad school and, and ended up kind of studying, you know, like the left in Mexico and Europe and the U.S. You know, my research takes me to a lot of like communist archives in Mexico and And so I just kind of really started to get involved in leftist literature and theory at a time when I was still trying to kind of figure out how to process the stuff that had gone on, you know, in our in our family life. Once the recession hit and once everything went south, I could see him receding into himself and I could see the rest of us kind of following suit. The thing that really shocked me was that the thing that he had made his life doing, you know, like was no longer working, which was like kind of working in real estate. And so since, you know, I don't know, for like the past three years, he's been driving Uber. And obviously I I hate Uber as a company and I hate the kind of economic labor model that it's based on. But I did see some silver lining in what he was doing, which is that, you know, my dad's a charming guy. Like I said, he doesn't talk a lot, but he's like really easy to like. And he's such a lovable guy. And, you know, he was getting into conversations with passengers and was finding out 
through that in a way that like, you know, we were telling him for years, it was like, this isn't just your fault, right? This is the economic recession was not something that you could have, you know, like um, completely avoided. And it's not, you know, like something that you had complete control over. No matter how many times we told him that, it, it would never sink in. But once he started talking to other working people, and realizing that they had the exact same experience, that he was driving people who had also lost their homes or who were on their way to their second jobs when they were 60, right? That experience was what really started to bring him out, I think, of his depression. And that really helped him kind of see that this wasn't just something that he was going through and that he needed to hide from the world because he was constantly being reminded on the television and on social media that the world was moving on without him. This is, this has been one of the most fundamental organizing tactics in labor in the past, right? Get workers to talk to each other about their paychecks, right? Get them. And and many companies still try to illegally say that you're not allowed to talk to your coworkers about your paycheck, right? They don't want you talking about, the conditions of your labor. And, and it's for good damn reason, because when we do, when we start to talk to each other, many things happen. One, we, again, we start to relate to each other in a way that isn't dictated by the employee and co-employee colleague uh, relationship or employee customer relationship, right? We start to see each other for the kind of complex people that we are. And in that, we start to also realize that we are collectively living under burdens that, 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 that shouldn't be there and that we are going to need to stick together to solve and fix and, 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 and bring to an end. In a lot of ways, the, what, I'm, what I'm doing with this podcast is nothing new. It's just, you know, kind of taking what I feel and what you have said, you know, has kind of been lost in our new media landscape in leftist discourse, right? In all the kinds of ways that we have been trained to live in the 21st century, right? You know, like people like Studs Terkel, who interviewed working folks, you know, and was a master at it. You know, he's definitely someone who's inspired me, right? Labor organizers who would facilitate these kinds of discussions between coworkers because they knew that once you kind of set fire to that sort of interpersonal relation that it's unstoppable that 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 recognizing our common humanity is a virus that will take over our entire being if we give it the chance to well thanks very much max for coming on the show today yeah man thanks for having me it was a really fun discussion in the interview that you do with people are they primarily with people of the left or is it a mix of different viewpoints so that's that's been a big you know aspect of you know kind of the show is that and and this was something that i that i had learned again not from academia not from you know the organizing circles that i'm in here it came from interactions with my family and and with my you know non-academic friends you know, like my, I grew up very Catholic and very conservative, right? Like, um, you know, I've said on, on, on like other interviews that like, I know that I got friends who can like blackmail me if they want, because there are probably pictures of me in like my Republican shirts when I was in high school. So it, it was just a kind of complete swing. And now I'm, I'm the, you know, the red sheep of the family. You know, I, when I go home, I'm most certainly the most left of the family. And my, you know, my dad is a lifelong Republican voter. He's a Mexican immigrant who lost everything in the recession, who voted for Trump. A lot of people on the white side of my family, or, or pretty much all of them, are Republicans. And a lot of people that I grew up with, right, are, are conservative. So, like, the first interview, obviously, we talk, you know, my dad and I, we talk about you know, what's brought him to the Republican Party, why he voted for Trump, kind of how he makes sense of politics as a, you know, working person who struggles to pay the bills. And, you know, in a lot of other interviews, you know, I kind of try to defuse the situation. Um, I'm very upfront about my politics, but I don't 
try to kind of force that onto the people that I interview. You know, I, sometimes I'll kind of like, you know, make jokes about it and say, you know, like I'm, I'm a lefty nut job, but you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to be right. You know, like, cause you know, I was talking after my dad, I talked to, you know, this amazing woman, Glendana Shevlin, uh, who was a Disney worker. And I mean, like, you know, she's, she's not, you know, like me, she's not a dyed in the wool, <laughs> you know, like uh commie, but um, you know, she was out there knocking on doors, trying to raise the minimum wage for Disney workers. You know, there was a fundamental difference between what each of us kind of like wanted at the moment in terms of like, you know, distributing the wealth and power of Disney, differentiating the power relations between um, employees and managers and stuff like that. But that honestly would just kind of it's it's more of an issue if you make it one. And, and, that, and that's also true in this kind of, you know, cultural climate that we're in in the States where so many people are terrified to get into discussions about politics. And most of them are just so overworked that they don't want to have to put up with the kind of emotional uh, strain that comes with, you know, talking and disagreeing about politics. You know, I think if you can navigate your way past that to, again, just communicate to the person across from you that like, look, I kind of just want to hear about you. Right. You know, I want to, to talk to you right now and I don't want to bring these other people kind of into the room and, and force your story to kind of address them. I want, I want your story to be what you want it to be. You know, I think that actually you know, I found in these discussions that if you kind of work that way, you end up finding way more common ground with working people than you may have thought possible. You know, you may find more often than not that, yeah, like just in their everyday experience at work, they're they're much more in line with kind of the values of kind of worker democracy, uh, redistribution of wealth and resources, tackling wealth inequality. I mean, they they hate politicians and rich people, you know, as much as the rest of us. Right. But it's kind of like the ways that we talk about these things to each other, right, is is almost more of the barrier. And I guess I want to put like a caveat there that I'm not pushing the kind of like Democratic Party line that, you know, we could all just get together and, you know, resolve our differences amicably. Right. Because that's, you know, that's that's not the case in a certain points. Right. There are people that I won't interview on the show. Right. And there are people who don't want to get in these kinds of conversations. Like, I recognize that there are way more people than we may realize who, in fact, are closer to kind of feeling the things that we feel and, and feeling the need for the kinds of changes that we want to see than we may initially expect. But we need to be able to kind of do the work of kind of reaching them on a human, non judgmental, and patient level to kind of really come to those conclusions together. It just seems that your podcast is, for me, it's a great I- idea. I have this book just sitting on the desk in front of me here, and it's called The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. And it talks about what British working class people, what they used to read and how they educated themselves and everything. We've kind of lost, I think the left has lost this idea of, a pride in working people and what they can achieve, even from a, like a kind of a propaganda point of view, you know, the, the worker as a, as a hero or the worker as a, someone to look up to. We don't work to both make connections with the, re, with the real workers and also to give them like a, an important position, you know, even if it's a symbolic position. I mean, you know, the symbol of the worker to give that a, an important position. I think that's been lost. Yeah, I mean, I, I would absolutely agree. And I think it's 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 either been lost or it's been twisted into something completely unrecognizable. And, 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 and that's, you know, like one of the peculiar things about this, right, is that, you know, like I've been in the kind of Internet left, left magazine world for, you know, a few years now. You know, I just don't find that kind of community and I'm putting community in air quotes there, 
you know, nearly as productive or uh, rewarding as, you know, the kinds of um, work that I'm doing for this podcast or the kinds of, you know, conversations that I get into with, with, you know, folks, everyday working folks, you know, whether it's for the podcast or not. Because I think you're absolutely right that like, I think more often than not, the figure of the worker is it's kind of taken up on terms that we didn't set. And so we're kind of playing a losing game from the beginning. So the the obvious example is that after Trump won the election, everyone was talking about the white working class. And, and that was just so drenched with these kinds of 20th century visions of the working class being an industrial working class and being a primarily white and male working class. Right. But as, as I think a lot of really smart and, and, and important writers today have pointed out, you know, the working class is incredibly diverse. The working class is women. Right. The working class is LGBTQ people. It is immigrants. Right. It is service workers and and the people driving your cars. Right. It is teachers. I mean, like, so I think one of the the other big problems to building a working class politics is kind of recognizing how many of us in this country are actually part of the working class, but who have been trained not to see ourselves that way, right? Because we, again, are, are kind of taking hook, line, and sinker, these kind of preformed notions about what the working class looks like, right? And who they are and what they think, right? There's another really great podcast called the, uh, the Trillbilly Workers Party. I'm giving them a shout out where they are based in Eastern Kentucky, and they are constantly railing about this kind of fetishization of like the Trump country coal miner, right? You know, it's kind of being this archetype of the, the, the working class voter that fits into this narrative about, you know, how reactionary, racist, uh, misogynistic right wing politics, you know, kind of take takes root in the backwoods of America, you know, like in the, the kind of podunk uh, um, worlds where people don't have these same kinds of complex, rich interior lives, but they're just more, you know, easily explainable because we're not doing the work to actually kind of talk to them. Right. So these, that's the kind of work that I gravitate towards. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do in this podcast. Cause I think one of the things people may notice is that, you know, we never actually define what the working class is, right? It's more defined by the people that I interview, right? And that's that's been a lot of women, um, people of color, you know, immigrants, and people working in like the hotel industry, fast food, telemarketing. We got a series on like sex work coming up, um, academics. I mean, like it's again, it's it's. It's about slowly kind of breaking apart the kind of preconceived notions of of what the working class is and and who populates it. So that's a big part of the the project here. You know, another thing just to kind of circle back to something that we were talking about earlier, where you know I was I was trying to say that like the kind of environment, especially the mediated environment that we live in today, incentivizes us to think and act certain ways. You know, I've kind of seen this play out in how the left today, the young left especially, kind of treats the question of the working class, right? Like exactly exactly like what you were saying, right? It's not that it's not there, because it is, but so much of it is kind of like repackaged and like run through this sort of like meat grinder of self that makes like the question of the working class, you know, only applicable to like the bona fides of the person who's talking about the working class. And so I guess to put that in clear terms, there's so many of these fucking like podcasts or writers who are just like, yeah, we're out here talking about socialism for like everyday people or for real, real ass people or whatever. And I was like, you never have working class people on there, right? You just kind of the only way that you try to kind of um, beef that up is to kind of say that, like, you know what the working class is like, because, like, you came up in it or, or, you know, people in it. Right. It's more about giving credence to the person who's speaking for the working class than it is speaking to the working class. And that was, to me, a huge absence in the left discourse today, um, or at least it was something that wasn't getting 
nearly as much attention as the kind of constant circuit of left media personalities talking to each other about the working class. I, I, I completely agree with you there. My podcast is so goddamn obtuse and theoretical. I don't even I don't ever make any qualms about it being something to do really with the working class. It's more a theoretical one. But so many of these podcasts that actually do kind of claim that they've got nothing to do with, with working people. I, I feel like people are all auditioning with their podcasts or with their left media with their left media in general. I think a lot of it is a way for career enhancement. Uh, that was that was kind of what I was going to jump in for. Again, it kind of goes to what I was trying to say before, where, you know, you're not really talking to each other, right? You're talking past each other. You're talking for this sort of like imagined judgmental audience whom you're trying to kind of ingratiate yourself with. You know, like the 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 fear working through theory is always going to be important, right? I like I said, I'm not. I'm by no means a fucking like theoretical Luddite. I don't believe in saying that like, oh, you know, theory and jargon has no purpose. Like if that were true, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> right. But yeah, it's more that kind of question of, of how we use the working class for our own ends and how we use it to kind of present ideas and, you know, think pieces and Twitter screeds, you know, that are ultimately at their base meant to kind of boost our own profile, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that aren't based in the kind of, you know, work of building a sense of solidarity between workers around the country, right? Between kind of populating in the minds of working people, kind of ideas of, of socialism and, and, and notions that this is not the only way things have to be. And, and I think that's been something that I've had to learn myself, right? Cause I don't want to stand here and pretend like I'm some saint. This has been, this has been a, a major learning process for me because I think as anyone listening to this podcast can tell, or anyone who, uh, you know, has read my work is that like a lot of times my problem is shutting up. Right. You know, like like other people in, in the left, especially, you know, men in or left organizing spaces. Right. I have to really I've really had to work at at knowing when to shut up and just listen, even if I feel that, like you know, what I have to say is is really important. And I'm worried that the conversation won't cover it if I don't come and grace people with like my blessed ideas. But in this podcast, I actually get a chance to be quiet and just listen and to just ask questions. And that's that's really changed the ways that I think about my own writing, my own organizing, my own worldview. Right. It's really kind of given me more of a faith in the development of political discourse and, and the development and cultivation of kind of meaningful relationships with people by just, you know, trusting in them and by talking to them and by giving them your undivided attention and by communicating to them that you don't have an ulterior motive, right? Because I've, I've had to say up front in, in some of these interviews, it's like, look, I have my own ideas about, you know, how we should proceed, you know, like, or what, what y'all should be doing at your workplace. Like you should strike or, you know, like you should do this. But I, but, you know, I'm not trying to like lead the discussion to that, I kind of just want it to go where you want it to go. And I found that more often than not, it gets way closer to what I was hoping it, where I was hoping it would go than it doesn't. And other times it actually informs me more than like the ideas that I had in my head beforehand, right? And it opens up kind of new possibilities for where worker action can go and where a working class politics can happen. This is really kind of the heart of, you know, this whole project, right, of, of building a left politics that is open, that is inclusive, that is internationalist, that is anti-capitalist, right, and that, that fights for the kind of justice, equality, and dignity of human beings against the kind of ravages of a capitalist world that take those things away from us. 
is that we have to kind yeah. of see <clears throat> how much in our everyday lives we dehumanize each other and we dehumanize ourselves in the ways that we, you know, kind of are taught to think about the value of our life experiences and our life stories and about the significance of the struggles that we face as either being something that just like a burden that we have to bear in silence or something that is symptomatic of a much larger problem that we are going to have to tackle together if anything is ever going to change. A friend of mine is recently started doing counseling work it was for people who are basically just giving up alcohol and drugs. It's like a place where they, where they live for a few weeks until they get over the initial bad patch. And he was saying that in his initial times, you know, he'd be in the kitchen with some of them and he would be talking to one of them. He would jump in and ask like the meaty question way too early. And the people would like bottle up, and yeah. they didn't like it at all. He was saying, God, he finds it very difficult at the start. And he said, like, one of the guys who was there, one of the cancers for a long time, he would come in and he would say hello and he'd just stand around and say nothing. And five minutes later, they'd be telling the exact same people would be telling him everything that Lee had just asked them. And he was like, going, God, that's weird. And I, I kind of feel like leftists stumble around trying to interact with, say, non-political people who are open to their ideas, but they're extremely, I include myself in this, clumsy in a way that it, it, that process of how you can win people over, I, I think that it's largely lacking in left people at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely true. and I And I would just... I kind of add the the one caveat to kind of drive home the point that this is this is a fundamental problem in kind of the media ecology in which left ideas and politics circulates today, right? By <clears throat> that I mean social media, the digital landscape in general that has become kind of the nervous system of of leftist politics <clears throat> and any politics in 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 a lot of ways. If we aren't mindful of that, you know, we can build this sort of myopic view of what the left is and isn't and what they are and aren't doing. And I guess I just, yeah, like I'm trying to say that, you know, people are doing this work, but they're not the people that we pay attention to. I, I've seen this on the end of, of, again, like I said, being a kind of left writer, writing for the left magazines and, and talking to the left personalities that you know, like are the, the, the people, the kind of thought leaders <laughs> of the internet left, right? You know, like I see what, what takes off and what doesn't, right? I see the hot takes and the personal gripes and the, 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 the like salty takedowns kind of being the things that get thousands and thousands of clicks and shares and, and that dominate the discussion, Right. But like <clears throat> these other kinds of ways of, of communicating and, and organizing are often not the things that are done for an audience or that they don't appeal to an audience that has been trained to want and to circulate certain kinds of content and to then kind of in a backwards way, kind of stencil that out to say that like, this is what leftist politics and discourse is and is supposed to be right. You know, there's so, so it, it's going to take a lot of work on our part to actually kind of, you know, be more mindful of the ways that we are consuming and participating in leftist discourse. And I think that you're seeing that now, I think you're seeing people get a little more exhausted with kind of the the heady personality like cults and debates on Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. I think you're starting to see more people take seriously for their own mental and emotional stability, but also for political efficacy, right? The work of talking to people in that kind of way that you were describing, right? Not just cannonballing in with these kinds of questions and ideas that are because what are those things doing? Like you said, the, the conversation with the with the guy who was just kind of in the room, being more quiet, letting workers kind of talk to him 
Right. And, and ending up where your, uh, your mate like wanted to get to by asking those questions. It's not necessarily the content of the question. That's the problem, right? It's the way the question is asked and the content or the context of the question. And that's something that again, we are not, like you said, we're, we're clumsy about it. We're not well practiced in it because it's not the kind of fodder in our everyday communications that, you know, rewards us and, and that, is normalized for us, right? It's not the ways that we're kind of being trained or training ourselves to talk to each other. And I think that this is really one of the the things that drives my own politics. And that has certainly kind of driven the podcast and that has, you know, like helped me develop through the podcast, right? Is that so much of the necessary work of politics depends on the care that we give to relating to each other, right? The care that we give to seeing and hearing each other in a way that reminds us that there are other ways to be in this world together and to engage each other in conversation that aren't dominated by the kind of ways of thinking and seeing and talking that, you know, capitalism has kind of made dominant. Right. And I guess uh, to, to maybe put like um, rubber to the road there, this has been, I think, the thing that that I've seen in the U.S. Because I know, especially when I was in like the U.K., this was something that that, you know, people there also thought was really annoying about Americans is this like political correctness problem. Right. Uh, it was always like posed as like, oh, you Americans don't know how to f- take a fucking joke. Right. You don't know how to take the piss. You get too offensive, too offended and blah, 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 blah. And this was like the catalyst in many ways for Trump's rise, right? Was this kind of anti PC backlash that has just taken the media world, the academic world and, and, you know, the social media world by storm. Right now to the point where like anyone who gets like involved in an argument claims that the other person is just like being too politically correct or what have you. And so it, it it's, political correctness when harnessed by the nefarious forces on the right, but also in the liberal center, you know, becomes a bludgeon to do really dangerous and shitty things. And so it's really important that we actually kind of think about what is being communicated when people say they hate political correctness. And this is something that I really learned again, not in academia, not in organizing circles, but in like going home and just talking to my folks or talking to my friends, right? I come from a very politically incorrect family, right? I think any Latino family uh, will be the same, right? There's just tons of like crude jokes and slurs that are thrown around, but like there's no doubt in my mind that there isn't any malice behind it. But if I tell like my Theo or my dad or, or, you know, my friends, I was like, Oh, you, you can't say that you're supposed to say this. Right. Or like, Hey, that's actually offensive. It's like your friend in the room. They're going to close up. Even if they believe the same things that I do, even if they agree with what I'm saying that certain words can be harmful, you know, like if said to certain people, because what's really at issue is not the word and it's not the political weight of that word. It's the interpersonal relationship that I have just severed at that moment by disrupting this kind of conversation with a person that I'm supposed to know really well. That's, that's what I think is leading so much of this political resentment. If you, like I said, tell close friends that they can or shouldn't say this or that a certain joke is offensive, what they're really, I think at their core, when they get mad or when they close up and, and then don't kind of talk to you the same way again afterwards, what they're really expressing to you is that they thought you knew them and they thought you, you knew them well enough and cared about them enough to meet them in the middle and to kind of do the work of understanding what they were communicating to you and why they wouldn't communicate that way to other people in other circumstances because they would be more mindful of like how it might impact the people that they don't know who are also involved in the conversation. Right. But if you, you suddenly stop knowing the person in front of you and you suddenly start making them kind of a, a a fixture in this kind of righteous war of discourse and politics and ideology, 
that again, in the way that you do it, it communicates to them that actually you're not talking to them or you're not talking, you know, with them, right? You're kind of using the conversation to do something else. And that is, I think, the source of so much of kind of the, the problems with that the left is facing in um, kind of communicating its message and, and building networks of solidarity with working folks. Not that our ideas aren't good and right and necessary, and not that our politics aren't the things that are going to save us from the destruction of the world and the murder of millions of people in the near future. And, you know, even going on today, right? But it's that recognizing that complexity of other human beings means taking as seriously as our ideas the complex tissue of social interactions that make us feel less alone in this world and that make us feel like people know us and and care about us and want to hear what we have to say. You engage that, you do that kind of work, you're going to make friendships and, and build bonds of solidarity that last for a lifetime. Yeah, it's a very tricky one, the political correctness stuff. I kind of have been all over the shop throughout my life on it. I used to be an, an extreme edge lord, you know. And yeah, so did I. <laughs> I've kind of, I, I've kind of gone the other way, where now I'm very much reticent to say things. But what the reason why I've kind of gone that way? Not that I'm one of these very politically correct people, but I noticed that some of the people who were attracted to being edge lords when you got down to the base of it i think they were kind of racists and sexists you know it's yeah. a very tricky one so right and i mean i but i think it also kind of comes down to again what what i was just you know talking about although it was kind of a you know circuitous way of of communicating it is that you know you can tell who actually you know like does kind of like have those sorts of like sinister beliefs and and conceptions in their head based on the ways that they you know treat other people like this and i think that's why the kind of pc backlash has turned into this sort of like nihilistic culture of trolling that is more or less like kind of the 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 ruling ideology of trump and trumpism right is that you can see in that that it's not quote unquote just a joke as so many people try to claim it is Right. You can see in the way that they're deploying these sorts of jokes and edgy comments and stuff that they don't care about the person sitting across the table from them. Right. That they that they do not give a shit about the kind of complex interior worlds of the people that they're trying to kind of, quote unquote, engage. They don't. I guess they're, they're more honest about that. They don't want <laughs> to really engage with people. They just want to have an excuse to write other people off for getting offended at what they say. Right? But I think that in other spaces where these kinds of, you know, discussions take place, like you were saying with your friend, you can get to the same ends, but you just have to do it in a way that communicates to people that actually, you know, you care about them and that you want to kind of work, that your ultimate goal is to kind of work together to, build a way to live together in a more kind of just and harmonious way and an enjoyable way. And in a way that, that kind of recognizes people for who they are, as opposed to kind of, you know, bullet points in an article that you read or as the butt of like some joke that you then want to retweet, you know, to your followers, those sorts of interpersonal dynamics work in very subtle ways that we just don't give them the credit for. And I think if we keep ignoring them, we're going to end up in a position where we are not only isolated from the very people we are trying to mobilize and reach, but that in fact, those very people are either coming for us or, you know, won't stand in anyone's way when they come for us. Right? You know, like we will just become unrecognizable to them and them to us. Right. And that's really the high stakes of everything that we're talking about here, of the conversations that I have 
you know, on this, on the podcast with other working people, right? The stakes are incredibly high, you know, f- because again, we live in the 21st century in a world that has made it easier than ever to see each other as just surfaces and, and archetypes and simplistic versions of humanity that are much easier to not empathize with and that are much easier to hate. Right? And, and the more that we kind of allow that to play itself out, the easier it's going to be for groups of us to get picked off one by one. And for us to kind of watch a communities be exterminated around us because, you know, like we have become fundamentally blind to the plight of our fellow human beings because we have allowed ourselves to see them as less complex than we are. And I think that this is, I guess, to kind of tie a bow around this since, you know, your podcast is, is, you know, so good at, at digging into kind of the theoretical side of all this. And then from my side, you know, it's talking to um, kind of the people who are living through the effects of, of the things that are in the sort of economic and, and political theory that you look into, right? Is the, I think the big theoretical Marxist question here, right, kind of goes back to the problem of, of again, activating the working class, of, of raising consciousness, Right. Of 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 seeing the working class, the proletariat as a revolutionary subject of in one way or another, however we define that. And the question there is under capitalism and as the contradictions of capitalism continue to accelerate and to heighten, you know, like the 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 lived inequalities that we suffer through on this earth. As that happens, is is it the left's job? to bring workers to consciousness of a revolutionary ideology that they would not have, you know, like thought of or wanted, or that is alien to kind of their needs and wants, or are we trying to, in essence, tease out something that is there in all of us, right? That is pregnant in the drive to be, and be more human, a drive to be and be more human that is stifled and suffocated by the conditions that we live under, under capitalism. Is there a common human yearning for dignity and for equality and for something like freedom that can only exist when there is social and economic equality? Right. Are these sorts of things that are are in people, but that people have no outlet for or that have been kind of recuperated and sucked up and repurposed for the ends of the people who are running our system and who are constantly fucking us over? Does that make sense? It's like, is it is it our job to change people's minds or is it our job to listen to people and to gradually kind of work with them to see that the things that the ways that human life theirs or any others can flourish and can be enjoyed and can be lived in a way that doesn't predicate itself on the enslavement or murder exploitation of others, right? Is something that we can and should all have. If we are kind of drawing that out of people, if we were showing them that that the things that we deserve as human beings aren't pie in the sky ideals that can never happen in the real world, but that the quote unquote real world has fundamentally broken our capacity to see these things as necessary and real and right. Then, like I said, we have this kind of huge opportunity to talk to people who are experiencing the ways that our capitalist system is alienating them from the things that will help them lead happy, fulfilling, and dignified lives. What what we need, Max, is a whole load, a cadre of Dr. Phil's. (laughs) <laughs> for the left, you know, <laughs> we need to get Doctor Phil's and Tim Robbins for the left. 
Loads of <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> you can try that. <laughs> you, know, you 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 can work that uh work that out and let me know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters by Sun Ra and his orchestra. And you are now listening to Anton Karas with the theme from The Third Man. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. (laughs) 